you know, I think, in honesty, I think some of that happened under the Labour government as well. We brought more Surely people not. into... You know, I'm, I can stand back a little bit. And it's the thing that actually... I, I, don't, I don't understand why journalists don't challenge politicians more on that. Potentially, you know, teachers, everyday jobs that are people, firefighters, whatever, who can find themselves, not all, obviously, of their salary, but part of their salary ending up into that 40 pence tax um, band. And I, d I don't often hear challenges on that when I listen on the radios. It gets no. focused on the income tax and national insurance, but not on that. And, no, because... it, and it's almost like a, a break on aspiration. And that's my guest co-host on this week's episode of the For The Many podcast, which has been nominated for a Global Podcast Award, believe it or not. It's Caroline Flint, and you can hear the result of my chat with her and get all the new episodes sent straight to you as they're released by searching for For The Many on Global Player and pressing subscribe. And Jackie Smith is back this week. Plus, if you want to find out which Labour economic policy Jeremy Hunt might nick next, you can ring Rachel Reeves this Wednesday from 7pm. The Shadow Chancellor will We'll be taking your calls only here on LBC just hours after this year's budget is revealed. You may want to ask a question about that on Cross Question because that's coming up next on LBC. Ian Blackford is joining us, SMP MP for Ross, Sky and Loch Harbour, and he's the party's former leader in Westminster. Vicky Ford is Conservative MP for Chelmsford and a former Foreign Office Minister. Hashi Mohammed, broadcaster and uh, barrister, and he's the author of the book People Like Us, What It Takes to Make It in Modern Britain and Howard Cox is Reform UK's candidate for May's London mayoral election and he also founded the Fair Fuel UK campaign. Lots to ask them about 0345 6060 973 is the number to call and do watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. Donald Trump will appear on presidential ballots in November's election following a ruling by the Supreme Court. Colorado had tried to block him from standing over the Capitol riot. Host of the news agent's podcast, John Sopel, has been telling LBC the court appears to be treading carefully. For the Supreme Court to have intervened now would have seemed to me an enormous power grab by the justices. And the history in America is that the justices don't want to be do it playing that role. Talking to LBC this evening, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions says flights will take off for Rwanda at the earliest opportunity. Mel Stride made the comments, even though peers have inflicted numerous defeats on the government over the legislation. State media in Lebanon says three paramedics from Hezbollah have been killed by an Israeli airstrike. Earlier in the day, Israel was blaming the group for a missile strike which killed at least one foreign worker. And a town's been evacuated in Texas because of the largest wildfire in the state's history. Sanford is home to around 100 people. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 42 points at 76.40. The pound will buy $1.26 and €1.16. LBC Weather with Ripple Energy. Climate action you can be proud of. Rain moving northeastwards across the UK overnight, but mainly dry in the southwest with showers in the far south and a low of freezing. From Global's Newsroom, for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello and welcome to Monday's Cross Question. I'm Ian Dale. Uh, on the panel with me tonight, to my left, Vicky Ford, Conservative MP for Chelmsford, former Foreign Office Minister. Next to her, Ian Blackford, SMP MP for Ross, Sky and Loch Harbour, who is the party's former leader in Westminster. To my right, Howard Cox, Reform UK's candidate for May's London mayoral election. He co-founded the Fair Fuel UK campaign. And next to him, Hashi Mohammed, barrister and broadcaster, who's the author of the book, People Like Us, What It takes to make it in modern Britain. Uh, they are gagging for your questions, literally gagging. 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850. You can WhatsApp us now on 0345 6060 973 and say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. There's no excuse. So many ways to get in touch. And also do watch us on Global Player. Call 
0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, let's kick off with uh, Stephen in East Grinstead. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Ian. Good evening to you. Good evening, panel. George Galloway, MP, the grandstanding one-trick pony. Will he purr like a cat that has got the cream or act as an XL bully when he savages his political opponents in Parliament? Were either of you actually in the chamber when he took his seat today? No. You were, did you deliberately boycott it? or? No, I was um, visiting medical school in Chelmsford with the health minister. <laughs> I watched it on, uh, on television in my room, so I saw him being introduced. Um, well, Ian, let's start with you. Um, uh, what do you think of Stephen's question there? You know, I think Parliament's got a way of swallowing people up, so I don't think George will have the impact that he might think that he would have. I, I regret, I have to say, that uh, he's been elected. I find his views quite repulsive, to be honest. We have to respect that the voters in Rochdale have put him in. That's really to do with the failure of the political system that we've got at the moment. But this is, you know, we, we don't need more division in politics. There are many issues that we face, whether we're talking about at home or whether we're talking about the global situation, the situation that pertains in the Middle East. We've got to get to a ceasefire. We've got to get to a situation that there's a road Map to recognition of of Palestine. Well, and you the agree with him solution. on all of that, don't you? Yeah, there's the I think there's a context of how you do it, and obviously respecting the rights of the Israelis and that making sure that the prisoners are are released. We 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 will only do that, Ian. If the political parties in the United Kingdom come together, and I regret that we haven't had the ability to do that, we've done it over Ukraine, we should be able to do it over this as well. We cannot divide over this. But, but fundamentally, what we then need to do is to make sure that there's a consensus across the United Nations, across the Security Council in, in particular. The death and the destruction, the loss of life in Gaza is something that should absolutely horrify all of us. And I would say to colleagues, regardless of what party they're in, Ian, that we have a we have a responsibility. You know, one of the things, and I've said in the chamber, we, we often reflect on the genocide. We, we reflect on Sabaritsa, Rwanda, Darfur and so on. We're very good at doing these things. What we need to make sure that we do, that we take our responsibilities when conflict is taking place. And we have that hand of friendship to both Israel and Palestine. In that regard, the election of George Galloway doesn't help us. Vicky Ford. Well, I'd go further than saying we don't want division in politics. We don't need division in society. And that's what I find really quite scary when you get these very extremist views. And that's why the Prime Minister took time to make that speech on Friday. Cause well, what, we have a question you know, on that, so okay. don't go too far down that road. Um, but you know, sitting in, in Westminster at the moment, you know, often as an MP, you can get quite a lot of issues directed at you personally um, when things are bubbling up outside. But actually what we've seen since that horrific attack in October in Israel and then since um, the situation and the deaths of so many civilians in, in Gaza is more and more hate being directed at ordinary sort of peace-loving members of the Jewish community, members of the Muslim community, a huge rise in anti-Semitism, a huge amount more hate being directed at moderate Muslims and this is being stirred up by, as the Prime Minister said, by far right, by Islamists as opposed to Islam is very different but by this extreme view and that's what really worries me. We've got a history in this country of being tolerant, of getting on with each other, of letting people from all walks of life, all religions, all creeds work together in our communities. And we mustn't lose that. We well, mustn't well, lose that. I mean, going back to the question, what, what do you think George Galloway is going to be like as an MP? Now, he hasn't been an MP, I think, for, is it 13 years? Mm. Well, since 2013, I think I read somewhere. Um, He's not going to add to the unity of the nation, is he? Well, I, I wasn't in Parliament when he was here before, but he's very clearly <laughs> already trying to stir up that that hatred against the people in the middle. 
against the moderates and i think that's why it's so important well. so important that we don't let that happen i mean i think what happened here sadly was a failure of the labor party to field a candidate <coughs> that they could uh, work with uh, but i think they were absolutely right to get rid of the candidate who shared the views that he had made so clear but that left them in a, 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 a position that they weren't fielding um a respectable candidate it's shown huge Huge divisions within the Labour Party as well and actually we all need to protect the society that is tolerant of others. I wish we had a Liberal Democrat on the panel tonight because I don't understand why they put no effort into that by-election mm. because it was a Lib Dem seat from 1972 to 1997 from 2005 to 2010 and you think well why on earth did you not particularly when the Labour candidate fell by the wayside, and they did absolutely nothing. Anyway, that's a side issue. Hashi? Well, I think that George Galloway, I would summarise as being a solution to a problem we shouldn't have. George Galloway, I've described as a parasite who goes to places to literally just sow division, make the most of people's views that might not be palatable. But I also want to be absolutely clear as to why George Galloway is where he is and why he has exploited the kind of situation that we're in. The reason for me is quite critical that at the moment there is a sizable majority of people in this country who really strongly believe that there should be a ceasefire and that should be the position of our country. The Israelis may not take any, you know, care about what we might think, but that's what people think and that's not being represented in our political class and, and the political establishment at this precise moment in time. And so instead of actually engaging with that point that he is now using to exploit the situation, we get this weird debate about extremism and that it's all the Muslims who are interested in this. It's only the Muslims who are voting for George Galloway when a percentage, I think, was about 22% or something like that of Rochdale is actually Muslim. 28. 28% of, of Rochdale is actually Muslim. And when you see the majority of people who are protesting for a, uh, for a ceasefire to take place in Israel who are not Muslims, they're being smeared as these hate figures by whom? by somebody who was only for Home Secretary just not so long ago. By whom? Somebody like Lee Anderson, who smears somebody like uh, the Mayor of London in the way that he did about being controlled by extremists. By whom? Robert Jenrick, who was only just recently a minister. These are the extremists. These are the people who are sowing division in our society. And then they have the temerity to turn around and point at George Galloway as somehow he is the symptom of our problems. George Galloway is just reflecting... You just referred to him as a parasite. He is a parasite, but he's only reflecting the extremism that we're seeing in this government. The extremism of a Home Secretary only recently in power. The extremism of a Prime Minister who doesn't understand the public mood about this issue at the moment. And so for me, George Galloway is not going to do a single thing to help the people of Rochdale. I cannot imagine he understands a single issue for the most people in, in Rochdale. But he's there because the rest of you have failed. That's the reason he's around. That's the reason he's in Parliament. Is because the political class are completely absent. And when the real leaders and the moderates leave the stage, only the extremists have fun. And that's why we're here. Uh, actually, please I, stop I, pointing, pointing your finger at uh, me. OK, because actually it was the Labour Party who didn't field a candidate here as well. OK, this is part of the cause The Labour Party's not and here. Huge, I'm, I'm your part of the uh, government. And, huge and the Labour Party isn't here. divisiveness in that election. What about the Secretary of State? What about the Secretary of State who are talking the way that they are? Do and you want to address that? So... So uh, the Prime Minister has made it very clear in his speech, which we're coming to this next, is that we must continue to be a tolerant uh, uh, society that is tolerant of others. Everybody... So why hasn't he condemned every, what Lee Anderson said? Ev he has. No, he hasn't. He, uh, Lee he Anderson refuses to no say that it was an is Islamophobic no, attack. He took, he took the whip away from He took the whip away from him. But why, hasn't, okay? why did he take it off? He took, why? Because he said it's a completely unacceptable was it thing Islamophobic? to say. It's a completely, was it Islamophobic? A completely unacceptable was thing it to say. Was it Islamophobic? And the Prime Minister has been very, very clear that... Uh, the, 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 
uh, there is an argument over the definition of Islamophobia. The Mayor and of you London know says. The but Mayor of London says. It is absolutely says. clear that it is Vicky. racial and religious hatred, which is not acceptable. And that is why Lee has lost the win. Has Lee apologised to the Mayor of London? And, and the Lee, Lee has, has been asked to, apologize to the Mayor of London? Has he apologised? By the Prime Minister. And he's not, but he is no longer a member of my party, and I think that is the right well, he action is. He's to just, He's taken. just not a member of the parliamentary yeah, party. I think, you know, uh, we haven't heard from Howard yet, if you don't mind. I, I thank you for the... Um, I, I tend to agree with Ian and Vicky on, on this, and to some extent what you're saying, uh, Ashi. The problem we've got here is that what really alerted me is when he stood up in his acceptance speech and said, this is for Gaza. And there is uh, uh, the problem is this division that's being created right across the country. I'm a public, public, humble public affairs campaign. That's what I do, and I'm now standing for London Mayor to try and heal division in London because I think we have the most divisive mayor that there's ever been. I think Lee Anderson, what he did was uh, was actually identify the massive elephant in the room that's a problem, but it was a crass way he he, he actually said it. And we must uh, we must have a proper debate about it. We've got to heal these divisions and bring all parts of all ethnic groups all together because they are British, and we need to do that. Mm. And and I'm, unfortunately, in well, why, why would your party even consider having Lee Anderson given his divisiveness? Uh, well, I don't know if that's true. Do you know something I don't know? Well, apparently know? Richard Tice was seen talking to him in a motorway service station. Absolutely. As you do. Uh, as you do in a motorway <laughs> service. You're right. I mean, that was news to me as well when it came out as well. I have no idea what's happening. I do know, I've, I, I'm, I've got a lot of MPs that support what I do with the Fairfield UK campaign, and I've spoken to them privately. And, I, and, and believe it or not, for 50 years, I'm 70 this year, and for 50 years I voted Tory, and the Tory uh, 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 party is no longer Tory. And I know a lot of Tory uh, MPs are saying Reform UK okay. is much okay. more Tory George, than they George are. Galloway, though, I mean, that's the question. Yeah, apologies for that. But George Galloway, I, I find him a repulsive individual. I don't like what he does, it stands for. I, I, I Actually, I'm worried sick about what he's going to actually uh, stimulate across the UK with his uh, Workers' Party, etc., and in London, etc. We need to stop this division and bring people together, and that's what I would be trying I, to do. Um, but, you know, we brought a motion to Parliament a couple of weeks ago, I mean, it's well documented what happened. I don't think, even in the Brexit years, I saw the mm -hmm. tension yeah. and the bile mm -hmm. that we had in the chamber mm -hmm. that day. And Ian, that has to be seen in the context of what's going on. Mm -hmm. The people losing their lives to the extent they are. Yeah, I accept there are people playing political games over this, and I would I would appeal to everyone to stop it because we've now seen thirty thousand. But it was deaths all parties. Gaza. I mean, with the possible but, um, exception yeah. of the Liberal Democrats, but, it was all the SNP, Labour, and the Conservatives all had their party political games that they were playing. But I'm I'm, but I'm appealing to everybody not to do that because there's something much more fundamental here and that is have that 30, you said that to Flynn? I have said it publicly in the chamber 30,000 people have lost their lives and you know I'll remind you that in 2014 the last time that we had an uprising in Gaza that the then Prime Minister David Cameron called for an unequivocal ceasefire that was the right thing to do then we have a responsibility to humanity and you know you can see the uh, you can feel the tension here tonight around this table we owe it to the people there yeah. you know we've talked about a two-state solution for decades and not had the capability of doing it. We have to respond to what happened on the, the 7th of October, that unspeakable attack that's that took point. place. But we need to recognise that the only way we'll solve this, if we can get to a solution for both peoples and all of us individually, collectively, as politicians, we have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. We must not let people down because at the moment, that's what we're doing. And people are now facing that here. Very whether you're in the Jewish community or whether you're Muslims, you're seeing an increase in attacks. We need to dial this down. We need to get to a safer place. I completely agree. Okay? And it's absolutely heartbreaking what you're seeing happening in Gaza. Absolutely heartbreaking. As someone who was born in Northern Ireland, I've said from the very beginning, you don't beat terror with more terror. Every single member of my party that I talk to wants to see an end to this war and a lasting peace. The difference is how you're going to achieve that lasting peace and what needs to happen to get there. So please, that is what everybody wants, every parliamentarian wants. The idea that some of us, if we had voted on your motion or voted on a Labour motion, were voting against peace is absolutely wrong. The difference is how you think you're going to get a stop in the fighting now and then a lasting peace Can for I the long term. Can I make one quick point, Bobby, because I think it's important. Quickly. Over Ukraine, 
as opposition leaders, we were called in immediately and there was a unity of purpose that we all had and we worked together over the course of the, the last two years. But that needs to happen at a senior level within Parliament as well. The parties have got to come together. We can't afford to okay. do There's a right. threat in you, Rafa you, and we must deal made, with it in the right the, manner. You've made that point. We'll move on to uh, something different in a moment. Well, I think Vicky has already preempted what we're going to talk you about did. next. I, well, I covered <laughs> it as well. It's 17 minutes past eight. LBC. Ian Blackford, Vicky Ford, Hashi Mohammed, and Howard Cox with us answering your questions. Let's go to Martin in Doncaster for another one. Martin, what would you like to ask? Hello, Ian and Paolo. Yeah, brilliant show as well. Was was the PM's lecture and speech just a publicity stunt for the ele for the ele election? Um, this was a speech that Rishi Sunak gave in Downing Street at 20 to 6 last Friday. Um, sent the entire Westminster lobby in a, into a complete spin because, of course, when that happens, you automatically think he's going to announce an election or he's resigning or something. Um, it wasn't that. Um, Hashi Mohammed, what did you make of that? Was it a publicity stunt? Um, I, I mean, calling it a publicity stunt is probably a generous way of putting it. Um, I think it probably was and much, much worse. Um, for me... When I see Rishi Sunak give a speech like that, it's a bit like an arsonist who has had a big hand in burning your house down and then turning up and saying, let me be the fire brigade and help you put this out. Rishi Sunak and his government, including his ministers, have done more to sow division in this country in the past 12 months than anyone else. They set the tone of our debates they are the ones who put motions in Parliament. They are the ones who make us feel the way that we feel about immigrants with their Rwanda bill. They are the ones who keep 
telling us that they want to do this and do that. They're the ones who talk about extremism. And when you hear the likes of Robert Jenrick, when you hear the language of the likes of Lee Anderson, when you hear the likes of Suella Braverman, who, by the way, just the other day was tweeting about how our immigration numbers are so out of control, without the irony of actually pointing out that she'd been Home Secretary just 12 months ago. I mean, it's just crass and cruel. And then the worst part of it all is you have somebody like Lee Anderson speak the way that he spoke about the mayor of London being controlled by Islamists. And the prime minister is so powerless that he can't remove his, him completely or even compel him to apologize. He's so powerless that he, all he can get is his ministers to turn up on radio stations and just say it's wrong without telling you why it's wrong, what he has said. So that lectern speech, if I was to give it the highest possible uh, um, benefit is to say that it had all the words that you might want to hear in a, in a speech that wants to unite the country. But the messenger means that it was actually not a speech that was worth giving. It was dead on arrival. Howard Cox. Well, I think it was full of vaporware, hot air. Um, I'm really saddened. This is a speech he should have given, or a prime minister should have given, years and years ago. And that's the problem about what's happening at the moment. The division, we've, that word has been a common word thrown about here, division. That's all we're seeing here. And the, that is where I am really angry with. And what, going back to Sadiq Khan, he actually controls the police and allows hate speech marches to carry on. He's a police and crime commissioner, and he's done nothing to, to actually stop that. Now, Does Sadiq Khan to, control uh, what the police can do? Is that what you're seriously saying? No, I'm not seriously saying that. I'm, if you listen to what I'm saying, he's in charge and he could t say to Sir Mark Rowley, what are you doing? Why are you allowing these hate marches and hate speech marches to carry on? And my point about this is very, very simple. That speech from Rishi Sunak didn't have, have had no actions of what was going to happen. It was purely hot air. Vicky? Well, I'm quite glad that he did stop and say we've got to stop and think about what's happening in this country right now. And <coughs> as a prime minister, you know, as he said, you know, he's the first British Asian, he's a Hindu, he firmly believes that Britain is a country where you respect all people from all different backgrounds, all different cultures. And what you've seen happening um, more recently is a growing hatred being directed um, either at the Jewish community or, as he said in his speech, at members of the, at Muslim women who are just trying to push their pushchair with their babies in it through a park, getting hate directed to them as well. And it's got to stop. I mean, it is illegal in this country to um, use racial hatred, to use religious hatred. It is illegal to glorify terrorist organisations. And that's got to be policed. And what he also said to the police is, we've got your backs and we will support you to do this. But we, ha the way it's Perverting but support isn't democracy. enough, is it, Vicky? Support isn't enough. He's no, got to actually give got to some have actions, And he said that there's yeah. going to be a, a platform of actions coming up as well. I mean, it, it, I, I, I came back into Parliament last Thursday, um, not last Thursday, the Thursday before, the night after we'd had that furore over the SNP motion. I, I delayed giving evidence to the police that day about the latest individual who thinks it's perfectly okay to harass, stalk and make threats towards Member of Parliament. Uh, he since was arrested in question you. by me, i.e. me. He had previous of doing it to a Labour MP as well. Um, and it, it is really scary when you receive these threats, especially, you know, I'm an Essex MP, David Amos was one of my, my neighbours. You never know if it's just somebody who's a bit disturbed and is actually no threat or if they are a real threat to you. But what you're seeing with this... Um, attacks that you're getting on politicians and the constant threats. I mean, three women colleagues from different parties are now having to have police protection. Okay, This is is undermining our democracy. Uh, uh, and you're, democracy you're absolutely is right. really important. But, really important. But politicians also have to be careful of the language they absolutely. use. Absolutely. And yeah. I would submit to you 
that when you have an official, officially appointed deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, party mm -hmm. telling migrants to F off back to France, language like that is not only unacceptable from a backbencher, but it's certainly unacceptable yeah. from a deputy chairman of the party who was then supported by Number 10 and Cabinet Ministers. I mean, that was a bit of a light bulb so, moment for me. So, I, I am not a minister, but I have but said a number... Of, uh, and No, I don't think I was. And I have number of times I have said we politicians need to be very, very mindful of the language that we use, OK? The language that Lee Anderson used was wrong. He had the whip removed from him, which is the strongest thing you can do because it ends it was your official career. Wasn't it? it? It was wrong because it was. But why okay? was it wrong? Absolutely, because he People accused. People listening would want to. Because it was simply there was no evidence for if it. There's said, lots if of evidence said it's about for things, a, other things that I think the mayor of London If it said it about a Jewish person, moment, we would have wrong. called it anti-Semitic. Why can't and you call it Islamophobic? My understanding is that I mean I use the phrase Islamophobia, but I understand, and I will do that. But my understanding is that there's a, a, a disagreement about whether or not it's using religious you know or it when you see Let's it, just don't say, you? absolutely, hate speech towards Muslims is wrong. And what's is that wrong. hate speech? That was hate speech towards Muslims. That. Okay. okay. Ian. And it, the Prime Minister has said that. Ian. We have to remember this is an election year. And, and, and I have to say... I think Ma 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 Martin in Doncaster was doing exactly that. Yeah, and I'm really worried about where we are. Yeah. I mean, for, I, I take a step back now and watch Prime Minister's questions and I, and, and I, and I look at the name-calling that goes on. Actually, it's not name-calling. It goes beyond that. Uh, because of the... I mean, I'm not here to defend Keir Starmer. Why would I do that? But someone that had a role as a director of public prosecutions and then told he's a, he's a, he's a friend of, of, of terrorists, he's a friend of sex offenders and so on. You know, we all have to remember what we should be doing is putting our case across. Why should someone be voting for me, voting for, for, for Vicky or whoever else? But there's a real danger that unless we can actually seize the high ground and actually talk about ideals, principles, I hate to say even morality in that context as well. In Parliament, we're setting the scene, we're setting the tone. And Vicky's right, to see what's happened over the last few years with MPs, mm -hmm. Why on earth would people now want to come in and enter public service when they see what's happening? You, you get the politicians that you deserve, but we need to create a better climate where there's a mutual respect. Yes, divide on ideas, divide on principles, but we are not setting a good example. Two weeks ago was a, a prime example of that when you referred to the SNP opposition day. Go back to Brexit, where the division that we saw in the House at that time. I remember the Speaker called all party leaders together on a particularly hateful afternoon in Parliament. And the then Labour Party Chief Whip defended what was going on on the basis of free speech. Now, we would all defend free speech, but free speech comes with responsibilities as well. And, and Which you, the you, then you look, Speaker of the House you, of Commons might have borne well, in mind himself. But, but then, when you look at what's happening on Twitter now, and we can all be appalled at what we see, politicians commentators, journalists, the media, we all have a responsibility to lead by example, and quite frankly, we're not doing a good enough job. OK, right, uh, we'll move on in just a moment. It's half past eight on LBC. Tim Daly has the news headlines. In the United States, the Supreme Court has restored Donald Trump to the presidential ballot following an attempt to block him. Colorado had tried to stop him standing over the January 6th Capitol riot three years ago. The House of Lords has inflicted a series of defeats on the government's Rwanda bill this evening. It means there'll be a prolonged battle now between peers and MPs. And another Tory MP is standing down at the next general election, saying the Conservatives have lost their way. Last week, former Minister Paul Scully apologise for claiming parts of Birmingham and London were no-go zones. LBC weather, rain moving northeastwards across the UK overnight, but mainly dry in the southwest with showers in the far south and a low of freezing. LBC.
8.34. Uh, Ian Blackford is here with us. Vicky Ford, Hashi Mohammed, and Howard Cox, who's standing for Reform UK in the London mayoral election. Why? It's a good question. It took me three months to say yes, but I, I alluded to it earlier. I'm, I've been voting Tory for 50 years of my life. I'm a Thatcherite, uh, but I don't see a Tory party that I recognise from what I want to vote for. And I was approached by Richard Tice, uh, I, you know, because I've been campaigning for 15 years, managed to freeze fuel duty for, in that time, for 14 to 15 years. I, I hope on Wednesday Jeremy Hunt does the same again, preferably cut it. Uh, Ian Blackford and his party, SNP, have supported me. The Tories of backbenchers have supported, but, and a lot of Labour people. It, fundamentally, I'm standing because I'm fed up with the way drivers are treated in London. So you're really standing for Fairfield UK rather than... No, Reform no, UK. there's ULEs, there's LTNs, there's speed bumps, so 20 mile an hour. Well, nightclubs. Oh, no, 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 what, no. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go down that road because we haven't got time because um, we're, it's, it's been a bit of a crotchety cross-question so far, I think. So we thought we'd introduce a subject now um, which is can bring you all together, tax cuts. <laughs> um, Scott in Norwich, he's actually dropped off the line, I think. Or is he, is he back now? Scott, you're back. Uh, give us your question, please. Um, good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Evening. Uh, my question is, with the budget fast approaching, are tax cuts the right approach for Jeremy Hunt to take? And don't forget the Chancellor's opposite number, Rachel Reeves, will be taking your calls on the budget exclusively on the show on Wednesday evening from 7. Um, tax cuts. Vicky, let's come to you first. So, first of all, if you have a country that's got lower taxes, they tend to have a faster growing economy. And if you want good public services that are growing public services, you need to have a growing economy. And so that's the economist in me, and I studied economics, I'm saying, you know, let's make sure that we have affordable taxes that encourage people to work and uh, continue growing the so economy. So you must be deeply ashamed that we have the highest tax burden since 1948 under well, the Tory government. Well, there are reasons why we've got a high tax burden. Uh, the government did the right thing to support people during the pandemic make 400 billion pounds worth of money and last year the government picked up half of everybody's energy deals because of the energy crisis but we know that people have been struggling to make ends meet they've been seeing more and more of their money going in taxes so i would like to see taxes to come back but i also want high quality public services and we have been delivering that so we said we would deliver 20,000 more police officers that's I've done we said 50,000 more well that's done actually i've been out with my police last week We've been said we'd deliver 50,000 more nurses. I've been at the medical school in Chelmsford today, seeing those nurses who have been trained, we've recruited them. So we are investing in public services as well, but I do hope that the Chancellor will be able to look at getting this balance right, because at the moment it is very high and we've got to get a tax level that also and encourages what's the, what's people What's the tax that you'd like work. to see cut? I'm sure there are more than one, but just pick one. Um... Well, I have something on electric car chargers, personally, that I would like to see. Um, I, I just think it's really unfair that if you have a drive, you get to pay 5% tax, and if you live in a terrace house, it costs you 20% tax when you charge your car. I think that's really unfair. But, Does it? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you have to charge on a public charger, it's 20% VAT. If it's from your own home, it's 5% VAT. Ridiculous. So, exactly. I think that's ridiculous. I think we should level up that, that tax. Or just so, get a diesel yeah. car. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you more must. people are changing that way, so that is one of my bugbears. So, I've been asking lots of different groups in Chelmsford what they would like to see in terms of if there was a money for the Chancellor to reduce taxes. I don't want to know what they want. And, I want to know what you well, want. My job is also to represent my constituents. Fine, but so I'd, I'd still like to know what you want. I, I agree with actually is the national insurance reduction because that is less inflationary. Doesn't help pensioners. And doesn't help pensioners so much but we have just increased the state pension very considerably um, but it is less inflationary so at a time when you're trying to also but keep inflation none down, None of your constituents down very few of your constituents will know what national insurance rate is so will they actually bank it because uh, I mean it is a tax cut, you're right but I don't remember the polls increasing for the so, Conservatives after the, the national insurance cut in January. So I, I've been doing a lot of discussions with small businesses, with larger businesses and I've said to each of them, if the Chancellor had money, should he go for the national insurance 
or should he go for um, the income tax? And they've tended to say national insurance. It's really, they can see that that's him okay. helping them to employ more people. It's money in working people's pockets and they want, and it's less inflationary and we need to keep the inflation coming down. It's come down hugely, but even more would be great. Hashi. Um, the answer to your question is no. And the idea that after 14 years of Tory misrule, and by the way, I would be saying the same thing about Labour if they were in power and having done this, but the idea of the 14 years where you will struggle to get a, a GP appointment in real time that is actually responding to what you need. You'd be struggling to find a dentist in most places in this country where there's been 45% cut, real-time cuts to local government, where departments are cut, where most local government is really providing social care in the community and not much else. The idea that now is the time to cut taxes in order to sweeten people to be able to vote for you is bonkers absolutely bonkers we have a massive productivity problem since the time when we went when we went through the pandemic the number of people that our economy has lost who are no longer productive no longer working is astronomical we need to think about how we get them back in work we need to think about Which, to be how, fair, the government have announced initiatives yes somewhere. they have and we need to do something about the fact that we rely on so much cheap foreign labor that has to come in and that's why we've got almost a million people coming into this country a year because we can't service our own uh, uh, industry the idea that we want to make it easier for people to be able to people like me frankly to pay less tax let's be frank that's how honest I am. People like me to pay less tax because my siblings or, or friends of mine who work in the public health service cannot get a pay rise. It's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Okay. Ian Blackford. I have to say I, I agree with much of that. And when, when you look at the record over the last 14 years, there hasn't been much attempt to deliver sustainable economic growth. The reason that we've got the debt level that we have is because we haven't grown the tax base. And if you, if you want to do that, you need to have an industrial strategy. You need to have a plan to grow the economy. Tinkering with tax isn't going to do anything. And even when you look at the, the OBR numbers from the autumn statement, debt levels are going to continue to rise for the next four years. Unless you do something different, then we're going to be, unfortunately, stuck where we but, are. But Vicky's contention is if you cut taxes, that stimulates economic growth, and there is something in that, isn't if it? You, if you look at the Tory record going right back to them coming into power in 2010, you've had tax cuts, you had corporation tax cuts. It hasn't worked because there isn't a systematic programme to drive investment into the economy. We have a low Got wage economy. Trickle down economics. Yeah, we have is we have a, we have a low scam. wage economy in this in this country. Now you think about green energy and what that might mean. And there's been a big furore over Labour's plans whether or not they were going to invest 28 billion in green energy. Actually, they should have stuck to that because unless you get that investment in, unless you get ahead of the curve, you know, I've, I published a paper in Scotland two years ago about we can increase our green energy output fivefold. We could deliver 235,000 jobs in the green energy sector unless you're serious about this and you recognise that you've got to get to net zero, and you turn that to a competitive advantage, you, you, you then actually have an industrial policy that will drive an investment, deliver the jobs, deliver higher living standards, delivering the tax receipts. That's how you'll get the tax burden down, but you need to have a, a concise plan in order to do that. That won't happen with the budget on Wednesday. Howard? Well, I'm sorry to say this, but I, I, I'm just going to disagree with Ian and uh, Hashi. Uh, I think we you got shock to, us. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we should stimulate uh, and trust consumers. Give them more money to spend. Put it into the economy. It will stimulate growth. Liz Trust did one thing wrong. She talked about growth, which I was totally in support of, but the way she delivered it and too quickly. I would cut uh, uh, c consumer taxes like fuel duty. I'd obviously say that because that's what I've been campaigning for 14, 15 years. Because that has immediate impact on cutting inflation and passing through, generating uh, uh, GDP growth, uh, business investment, and believe it or not, give a, a logistics uh, 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 where 44 percent of their costs of fuel, give them a cut in fuel duty. So you duty. are standing for Fairfield UK, aren't you? I, I, yes, that's one reason why I'm doing it. Yes, of course I am. But the, give that the logistics owner, that man, managing director who's struggling on 1% to 2% margins, uh, some money to invest in cleaner technology, cleaner fuel technology. We should be investing in that. To some extent, I agree with you, Ian, but fundamentally, trust consumers. 
please trust consumers. Give them more money, they will spend it wisely and watch what happens. The, the economy they just spend it on imports? What's that got to do with the price of cheese? Well, if people just spend money on imports, it does nothing to our, yeah, but to what, our growth, Why would it? they do that? Yeah, but why? We, we well, need because, to incentivise British purchases. Because we don't, purchases. we don't manufacture enough for people to... No, to well, yes, we, we need... Yes, I agree, we do need an industrial long-term strategy, but when has there ever been a long-term strategy with any government in the last 20 years? Yeah, but if, if we are going to have a trade deficit, that someone else is going to have to finance. That's the problem. You look at the guilt market, look at the yep. debt interest that we have at the moment, we're, we've now actually got monetary tightening because Correct. we're reversing quantitative easing. Where are you going to get the growth in the money supply from? Unless you drive up investment, unless but, but you actually get that investment, if we just become a consumption society, who's going to pay for the public services? Who's going to be so driving your buses, with your growth, paramedics, with growth your taxes, police officers? But, but there would be much more corporation tax. It's already at 25%. It should be at 19 So, well, it's actually, a 25% for investment in the NHS has gone up by 45% since 2018. That's a number I was told today. 45%. More money going in, but actually we do need to get productivity up That's as well. That's the point. The, this government has created, on average, 800 jobs every day since 2010. No, I think you'll find business Massive. people. Massive. Business people. Massive. Yeah, with the, the help of the government. Jobs, with the help of the government. And ta having a tax regime that supports business, that supports working people, is vital to that. As is so how does the investment putting in corporation skills. tax up to 25% well, help that? So exactly, that's why we need to have a tax regime that works both for working people and for business. The encouragement we had in the autumn statement to enable businesses to offset their investment hugely if you, helpful if you speak for to certain anyone, businesses. Anyone in this country, this country, anyone who runs a small business or a medium-sized business, anyone, they will tell you that they are worse off after a Tory government. Whether it's the well, tax burden, I'm whether not it's the conditions to run a business, they are worse absolutely off. Absolutely not the case. And this country in the past two years has had more foreign investment, direct investment into startup, into real investment, not buying British companies, but into real building factories, putting money here than any other country in the world except for the US. This is a country that people want to invest okay. in. Okay. GDP okay. per capita okay. in the UK gonna, has been negative since to, the beginning of 2022. We're going to have to move on, the I'm afraid. It's 8.46. This is LBC.
Don't you? Oh, it's 8.49. We have oh, with us Ian Blackford from the SNP, Vicky Ford from the Conservatives, Hashi Mohammed from himself, and Howard Cox from Reform UK. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't an insult, by the no, way. You're doing very well representing yourself. Right, yeah, let's go to another text question from Jamie in York. Does the panel think Piers Morgan will win his bet with Rishi Sunak? Now, you may remember that when uh, Piers Morgan interviewed him in his late lamented TV show, uh, Rishi Sunak accepted a bet that people would be going to Rwanda by the time of the election. Well, tonight, the government has lost five votes on amendments to its Rwanda bill in the House of Lords, all related to whether Rwanda can be deemed a safe country to send refugees to without judges intervening. Piers will resume debating the bill on Wednesday. Um, so, um, Howard, do you think that Rishi Sunak will win the bet? No. I, I, Piers Morgan is on to a certainty there, and just despite the fact it's an infantile flipping bet they put together between themselves, I think it was a bit pathetic. Uh, Rwanda, they, they, nothing will go out there. Maybe two, three people might pop out there. Who knows? I don't well, know. Well, then Piers Morgan wins, doesn't he? Well, sorry, it, I Rishi, think, I, Rishi Sunak I, sorry, wins. Sorry, Rishi, if one person gets it, he wins. And yeah. I, I think, but I still don't think it's going to work, and I think Piers Morgan Why? will Why? Because of the, the scheme that they've put together, or because the law will intervene? Or? I think the law will intervene. You just said about that they've lost some, uh, some uh, uh, motions and, um, and bills in Parliament. Is it five, you said? Um, the fact is, I, I am struggling to think of the, that being an, an active deterrent. It's a complete expensive waste of time. Ian? It is a waste of time. It's a massive distraction. Quite why the Tories wanted to bring this bill back in the in the first case, I just simply don't know. You're talking about a bill now, what, £500 million to, to attempt to send a handful of people to Rwanda? You know, the Tories want to discuss immigration, and that's their prerogative to, to do that and have a discussion about it. But any idea that this is a reasoned way for a government to behave? What a misuse of resources. We've just talked about the budget and the choices that have to be made. This is a monumental waste of money. It won't work. Um, I'm not a betting person, but I suspect that Piers Morgan will win his bet. Vicky? So on the substantive issue, I think the Prime no, Minister... No, 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 answer the question. So I don't think the Prime Minister likes losing bets. Okay, and he wants to make that policy work. Of course, he, he said he was not a betting person. Was not a betting that, man. So Before we then found out that on Test Match Special, he said he loves spread better. So... <laughs> he he wants to get those flights working, and on the substantive issue, I think it is an important part of the policy here. It's really important to stop the boats. They're incredibly dangerous, too many people dying. They, it, it's really unfair. It tends to be fit, healthy men and not the most vulnerable that we should be supporting. And it's also diverting billions of pounds of money that could be spent in helping to stabilise the countries and how, people are how many from. people do the Rwandans say they can take so, in a 12-month period? So the important point of Rwanda is that the, the fact that it is a deterrent to others. How if you've well, got this stat in answer, your mind, answer that question. it is tens how many, of thousands, How many people will Rwanda take in a year? It is tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but the no, fact is no, that it is a it's deterrent. Vicky, it's just a hundred. It's a deterrent it's to others. No, it isn't. 200 at any one time, 500 over the course of a year. And it is expandable. So it's not 10,000, And it is, is it? an expandable number. It is an expandable number. But the point is that it is <laughs> Is a deterrent. It's not a deterrent. How can it be? If, if you have 45,000 people crossing the channel each year and they know that only a couple of hundred of them could be sent to Rwanda, I think I'd, I'd, I'd take, probably I'd take, take that. I don't think that could be you. So, <laughs> what we do know is that the small boats are down by over a third That's because due to a number Albania of different measures, solved. including Albania has been solved, so more returns and more returns, I think you'll find it's growing and more again. policing. Vicky, it's going up again. But the deterrent current is an important part of it okay. and the fact that the Rwanda deal is expandable is an important not part to of tens of thousands well. it isn't has she um the Rwanda plan is unworkable it's unviable and it will never be a deterrent for three fundamental reasons the first is we know it's been tried in a place called Israel I made a whole documentary about it I'll send it to you later Vicky it never worked secondly if you think it's a deterrent, then you have fundamentally misunderstood the profound reasons why people make those perilous journeys. What drives you to believe that your life is better on that dinghy than on some land? If you have not understood that properly, then you would keep saying that it's a deterrent. It isn't. And thirdly, what 
we're spending about 500 million, we could probably put about 500 SAS troops for the whole year on that side, and that would be more of a deterrent. Absolutely. It's a puerile bet that is speaks to the character of the man that is the Prime Minister to have taken that bet. Yeah, yeah. And it speaks to the character of the man who offered that bet. It was a disgusting way to think about human beings, and he will lose that bet, and I hope he loses his office sooner. Right. Final question, or sort of final question, from David in Altrium. Um, David, go ahead. Oh, good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Um, I'd like the panel's thoughts on this possibility. If Donald Trump was elected as president of the United States of America, what do you, does the panel think that the relationship of the British government should be with a convicted rapist, a convicted fraudster? What do you think the um, relationship should be? I, I'm not aware that he's a convicted rapist. I think sexual assault, but not. I'm not sure no. the rape is right. I mean, let, let's get our facts right here. Um, now, this morning, the Treasury Minister, Bim Afalami, was asked by my LBC colleague, Nick Ferrari, about having tweeted just after the January the 6th insurrection in 2021 that Trump had been a cancer at the heart of US politics, a tweet he's never deleted. The minister said his tweet was appropriate, but added that if Trump does win in November, we will have a very strong relationship with him going forward. Um, uh, good luck with that one, Bim. Um, Hashi. Look, and I'm going to have to ask you each to do about 45 very, seconds. Very, very quickly, I think Trump is the worst possible outcome for the for the United States of America. But if he is in power, we have to work with him. We have to be nice to him. Mm. And we have to cooperate with him. Because whether we like it or not, the United States of America remains the most powerful country in the world and probably our most uh, closest allies. And out of respect for the American people who might have voted for him, and for the American institutions that we have to engage with, we have to deal with that man the way that he is. Howard. Of course we should work with him and plan to work with him. Let's face it, when he was actually in power, their economy was, was better than ever. Well, there was very few wars around the world. He was actually trying to negotiate. Look what he did with North Korea. Don't get carried away, Howard. No, I'm not going to get carried away. The fact is, he is the best option compared to Sleepy Joe. I would agree on that. Vicky? So America is a really important country and a really important ally and we have to work really close with America and as she's absolutely right, we have to respect the democratic process that get, they go through even if um, the candidate would not be one that we would have chosen ourselves. We've well, been admirably brief, in fact a little bit too brief. Ian, you can expand a little bit. If you <laughs> yeah, like. I think what you have to do is to respect the office and respect mm. the people of America, but not the candidate. There are some enormous challenges that we face, not least his views over Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the UK and Europe has got yeah. a tremendous job to do to make sure that we support Ukraine, that they win this battle against Putin. And we need to try and bring the administration, if Trump does win, to its senses, because the risks that we face, the geopolitical risks that we face today are enormous. I am worried about that. And showing leadership is vitally important. But goodness gracious, this is a man I simply do not want to see back in the White House. And I'm ashamed that his mother, Mary Ann McLeod, came from the Western Isles. I'm sure she wouldn't be ashamed of that. She didn't have anything to do with him. No. We should give birth to <laughs> um, Several of you saying Trump was convicted of rape. Well, he wasn't. In May of last year, a New York jury in a civil case found Trump liable for sexual abuse and defamation against the writer E. Jean Carroll, but found him not liable for rape. However, the judge later uh, ruled that based... Sorry, I'm, I'm reading something while Corey's writing it, or Chris is writing it. Uh, however, the judge later ruled that based on the common definition of rape, he did rape her. Well, make of that what you will. I don't understand that. No, I don't really understand that either. Um, so let's, let's finish off the programme with our usual fun question at the end, which is also about Donald Trump. It's from Tina in Leicester. The late Sinead O'Connor's estate has asked Trump to stop using nothing compares to you at his rallies because she made clear she didn't like him at all. What's song would you use to best sum up Trump? Ian. Carly Simon, you're so vain. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that's about most politicians, frankly, couldn't you? Apart from you, Vicky, obviously. <laughs> 
Um, I don't know. I can't beat that. I was just thinking one of the sad things about this American election is it's two such old men. You know, oh, I wish we ages. had. I know, Careful, but Vicky. you know, I love older people. You two are young. I well. love older people, but. Yes. Um, but, but there are really, to love. you know, taking on okay. a four-year what, job, what's your song? and so I thought, what's a song for an old crooner? Um, and I thought Frank Sinatra, and I thought My Way. Except I don't think he's Frank Sinatra, okay. and I don't want his way. So there you go. <laughs> no, I was, I was about to say something <laughs> that I could get into trouble for, but I won't. <laughs> Howard, you won't remember this band, I suppose, Emerson Lake and Palmer. Uh, yeah. so you remember Emerson? Well, Lake I don't know. I thought you were young whippersnappers on this panel. Um, <laughs> there's a famous song which I think it's called Lucky Man. Oh, what a lucky man he was. That. Exactly, but that's the song I say. He's a lucky man. Look, he, everything's thrown at him, and his well, polls go up. Ian is the winner so far, Hashi, unless you can do better. I, and I don't know if you know of a, of, a, of a band called The Beatles. They had a song called I'm a Loser. Yes, they did. <laughs> yeah, but he's not. That's well, the thing. That's he, my point. He keeps saying, man. you're a loser. You're a loser to everyone. So well, That's uh, true. Now, Ian Blackford wins that hands down. <laughs> so, well yeah, done, I, Ian. I agree with that. Um, so, Ian, Vicky, Hashi and Howard, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Uh, on tomorrow's Cross Question, we have the Conservative MP, Damien Green, social commentator and satirist, Nels Abbey, uh, my new TV wife on Good Morning Britain, except he's male, uh, Labour MP, Nadia Whittam and the Daily Telegraph's Annabel Denham. So, they'll be here taking your calls tomorrow. And, of course, Wednesday, don't forget, Rachel Reeves from 7 o'clock, taking your calls on the budget a mere couple of hours after it's been delivered. Now, in the next hour, police have failed to solve a single burglary in nearly half of all neighbourhoods in England and Wales in the past three years, despite pledging to attend the scene of every domestic break-in to boost detection rates. I mean, that seems incredible to me, but it, it, those are the official, uh, the official statistics. What's your experience of being burgled and then your experience of the police. And I want good experiences as well as bad experiences because we do like to be balanced and impartial on this programme, don't you know? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, the government's Rwanda bill has suffered five defeats in the House of Lords this evening. The controversial legislation will now go backwards and forwards between both Houses of Parliament as MPs and peers try to reach agreement on the legislation and also the matter of Rwanda being described as a safe country. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, says people should remember numerous conventions. Winston Churchill's advocacy...